Robert Mann's curatorship of ideas and society is emblematic of that purpose, and fittingly, the upcoming program for the year is a courageous and provoking one. I know many of you already have your tickets for the next event on the 13th of August, which is also in this venue. That debate will feature Professor Gillian Triggs, the renowned international lawyer, author, and former president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, and Greg Craven, the Vice-Chancellor and President of the Australian Catholic University. Greg and Gillian vehemently disagree over the desirability of an Australian Human Rights Charter. So that will no doubt be another night of lively debate and discussion. Um, I'm pleased to announce some new Ideas and Society events. On the 17th of September, also in this venue, we have Bob Brown, David Ritter and Amanda Cahill for a debate on the implications of the recent election result for those involved in climate change activism. Then on the 30th of October, in the Theatreette at the State Library, the theme will be Trade Unions, Are They Good or Bad? Where we will hear from Bill Kelty, a famous Latrobe alumnus, and just Jennifer Westacott. Now that's likely to be a lively evening. The Ideas and Society events are extremely popular. Tonight's event is, of course, sold out, and I expect tickets for the remaining events will go just as quickly. So don't delay if you would like to get hold of tickets for those events. But now on to tonight's debate. The issue of asylum seekers is complex and deeply emotional. Responsibility, morality, humanity, dignity, national identity, territorialism, culture, all of these collide in what is a raw, fraught, and often very personal debate over what is right and ultimately what we should do. Two of our discussants tonight are two of Australia's most respected social justice advocates. Yet on many questions associated with asylum seekers who come by boat, they differ in their views. And this is reflective of the highly nuanced nature of policy issues in this area. What strikes me is that the discourse around asylum seekers is still distorted by what governments have wanted the public to believe. Think of Tampa or the Children Overboard Affair and what they have sought to conceal. Most Australians to this day still have no real understanding of the conditions that have been experienced by the 900 refugees and asylum seekers who've been interned for the last six years on Nauru and Manus Island. What will be interesting as time moves on is to see how we tell ourselves the story of our response to refugees and to people seeking asylum in this country. But I'd now like to introduce our discussants for this evening. The first is Julian Burnside, AOQC, a barrister based in Melbourne. He specialises in commercial litigation. He joined the bar in 1976 and took silk in 1989. He's a former president of Liberty Victoria and has acted pro bono in many human rights cases, in particular those concerning the treatment of refugees. He's the author of a book of essays on language and etymology, uh, including Word Watching and Watching Brief. His latest book is Watching Out, Reflections on Justice and Injustice, and in 2004 he was elected as a living national treasure. In 2009 he was made an officer of the Order of Australia, and in 2014 he was awarded the Sydney Peace Prize. Julian was also the Greens candidate for the seat of, seat of Kuyong in the May 2019 federal election. Father Frank Brennan, SJAO, is a Jesuit priest and CEO of Catholic Services Australia. He is superior of the Jesuit community at Xavier House in Canberra. Famously described by Paul Keating during the 1998 WIC debate as the meddling priest, <laughs> he is <laughs> Professor at the PM Glynn Institute at the Australian <coughs> Catholic University and Research Professor at the Australian Centre for Christianity and Culture. He chaired the National Human Rights Consultation for the Rudd Government and has been a member of the Turnbull Government's expert panel conducting the Religious Freedom Review. An officer of the Order of Australia for Services to Aboriginal Australians, he was the recipient of the Migration Institute of Australia's 2013 Distinguished Service to Immigration Award and of the 2015 Eureka Democracy Award. 
And when launching Frank's book, Acting on Conscience, Kevin Rudd described him as an ethical burr in the nation's saddle. And he too has been named a living national treasure. And we're very grateful that Baruz Bashani, who has been detained on Manus Island for more than six years, is joining us tonight by Skype. Baruz is a Kurdish Iranian writer who holds a master's degree in political science, political geography, and geopolitics. He was writer for the Kurdish language magazine Wiria, is an honorary member of Penn Inter International, and the recipient of several awards including an Amnesty International 2017 Media Award, the Liberty Victoria 2018 Empty Chair Award, and the Anna Politkovskaya Award for Journalism. He's a non-resident visiting scholar at the Sydney Asia Pacific Migration Centre at the University of Sydney, is co-director of the film Chowka, Please Tell Us the Time, collaborator on the play Manus, and author of No Friend But the Mountains, writing from Manus Prison, which won the Nonfiction Prize and the Victorian Prize for Literature at the Victorian Premier's Literary Awards 2019. And it's available for sale outside. Incredibly, No Friend But The Mountains was written in Farsi, mostly through WhatsApp messages sent to his translator, Omid Tafijian. Finally, our moderator for tonight's debate is Dr. Madeleine Chiam. She's a lecturer at the La Trobe Law School, where her research examines the relationships between the global and the local, the language and the histories of international law. She has a particular interest in the role of international law in Australian life. She's published in several eminent law journals, and her monograph, International Law in Public Debate, will be published by Cambridge University Press next year. So as I hand over to Madeline, will you please join me in welcoming all of our discussants for tonight's, tonight's debate. Thank you. We'd better start disagreeing. Mm -hmm. We'd better start disagreeing. <laughs> we'll do our best. Thank you, John, and good evening, everybody. I also want to, to start by acknowledging that our event tonight is being held on the land of the Wurundjeri people whose sovereignty was never ceded, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And acknowledging that we meet on Wurundjeri country matters for many reasons, one of which is that it reminds us that modern Australia is founded on acts of dispossession and violence against the first peoples of this land. And this reminder holds particular resonance tonight, because in discussing Australia's treatment of the refugees who came by boat, we are confronting ongoing acts of dispossession and violence that are committed by governments that we collectively have elected. So we have three speakers this evening and the night is going to unfold like this. Each of the speakers has around 20 minutes to speak. Frank and Julian will be presenting keynotes from uh, the podium and we will be interviewing Beruz via Skype. After that, there'll be a moderated discussion for around 20 minutes. And then after the moderated discussion amongst the four of us, we will open up to all of you to ask questions. And I know that it can be intimidating to ask questions in a forum like this, which is being live streamed and recorded. Um, but let me encourage you to take the opportunity, if a question occurs to you as the discussion is unfolding, to let it percolate, write it down and ask it at the end. The more we have, the richer the discussion becomes. And then finally, of course, we are uh, relying tonight on the um, wonders of technology. And sometimes those wonders, often those wonders don't work as we want them to. So we just ask for your patience in the event that the, t the connection in particular with Beru's in uh, Manus Island goes a little awry. But we will, don't worry, we will manage everything perfectly. So assuming that we have Beru's there, we're going to see if we can get Beru's. Are we getting Beru's on screen? There he is. Beruz, can you hear us? Beruz, thank you so much for joining us. It is a room full of people who are um, waiting to hear what it is you have to say. So we're going to start, I think, Beruz, if you could just describe for us the current situation that you and the men in Manus find yourselves in, the conditions that you're in, and perhaps also the effect of the results of the most recent election. 
Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I would like to say hello to everyone. Uh, it is a great honor for me to speak with you from Manus Thailand. Uh, you know, as you are aware, uh, the election, unfortunately, the election has a big negative impact on uh, our situation. So the refugees in Manus Island and Nauru were expected that Labour will win the election. So because of this, that they announced in the uh, national conference that if they win the election, they will accept the New Zealand offer. So it was a big uh, opportunity and big chance for uh, refugees to get off of this uh, island, but unfortunately, so you know, like the, the Australian people, we didn't expect that uh, the liberals uh, return to power. So that uh, had a very negative impact on the refugees. So so far, since the election, so far uh, at least 100 times people attempt suicide and self-harm. Uh, but uh, fortunately, over the past two weeks, uh, I think the number of self-harm and suicide attempts uh, has reduced, uh, which is uh, good news for the, um, us because, uh, you know, what uh, make uh, us worry and concern is that uh, the refugees were doing some some dangerous. Uh, for example, a few weeks ago, one of the refugees uh, climbed on a internet tower, so which was very dangerous. And also, some of the refugees burned themselves and burned their uh, rooms. So I think it was dangerous. But, but uh, still, people are uh, so depressed and most of people are locked up in their rooms. So, uh, you know, our only chance right now is Medivac law, uh, which I think we give it until November. So we have four months uh, time that uh, seek refugees transfer to uh, Australia. What I want to mention, I think it's important, and the Australian media you know, the, don't report about it, is that the Australian government, uh, and particularly Peter Dutton, is lying about the number of people in Manus Island and Nauru. Uh, we are 300 people in total in PNG, but the government say that we are 531 people. So I think, which is wrong, you know, we are 370 people, and among these 370 people, at least 70 people already accepted by America, so we expect that they fly to America in next uh, two months. So over the past two weeks, uh, 38 people went to America, and next uh, week, another group will fly. So we expect that this 70 people fly to America in next two months. So now, uh, without the Americans, we are 300 people, 300 people. And in Nauru, uh, the number of people are 260 people. Uh, that 60 of them are waiting to fly to America. They already asked. So in total, I think we are l less than 500 people in Manus and Nauru, but the government says that we are more than eight, uh, 800 people. I think it's important we acknowledge this because uh, we can't say that, uh, you know, we can challenge the government that uh, so far uh, 60 or 70 percent of people in Manus and Nauru released, but the boats didn't come to us here. So the government is lying. So, uh, you know, I think 
we should challenge this uh, logic. We should challenge the government that we are not too many people here in Manusana and Nauru. So it is the time that they do something for us or uh, at least accept the New Zealand offer. Uh, many people say that what I think the solution is ready. The solution is ready, which is, uh, you know, accepting the New Zealand offer and work under the Medivac law. So if they, you know, I'm sure uh, on next four months, at least 100 people go to Australia from Manus. So we will be uh, 150 or less than 200 people. So if they accept New Zealand offer, so it will finish. But the problem is that the government uh, doesn't want to solve this problem. Over the past six years, they have kept us here because of different reasons. It's not because of the boats uh, coming to Australia or not. It's because of different reasons. First one, I think that is important, is an ideological reason. They don't like us. They don't, and it's written to the history of uh, Australia. And second reason is because of corruption. You know, they have spent $9 billion on this exile policy. And I think it's important that people acknowledge this, the media talk about this. You know, it's a very important point that we challenge this government. Another reason is the, uh, is the political benefits. This government always uh, put pressure on the labor and send this message to the Australian people that uh, are able to, uh, you know, keep the border safe, and they are using this kind of words and this wrong language. So they have benefits, political benefits, uh, on base of this exile policy. So I think it's important that after six years, people think about this, that the government is lying about the boats. The government is lying to the public. So we should challenge this uh, uh, policy in this way. And another thing I would like to mention, the refugees was for people that say that bring them here. And we should acknowledge this, that most of the refugees in Manus Island and Nauru don't want to go to Australia, <laughs> want to uh, get off of this island. And I think it's important uh, because the government always says that, yeah, these people want to come to our country, but we don't want. Already we uh, announced that. We published some letters and people signed it that we don't want to go to Australia. So uh, just let us go, let us go. So I think it is the time that uh, our movement, our supporters uh, criticize, uh, should criticize ourselves, you know. <laughs> I, always I say that, uh, so it is the time that we raise this question and we challenge this uh, policy in different ways because we challenged this uh, policy for years and years, but, uh, you know, our achievement is, you know, is not a big achievement. So we still people are in Manus Island and Nauru. So I think it is the time we raise some questions and we ask some questions from ourselves and challenge this government in different ways. My suggestion as a person who, who has so about this policy for six years is that we should focus on uh, some key points. Uh, one of them is uh, $9 billion that this government has spent on Manus Island and Nauru, and the problem still is remain. So they wasted time, they wasted money, and uh, you know we should focus on this. Uh, Baruz, it's Frank here. Uh, could 
Could, uh, could, could I maybe ask you a question about the 370, uh, so uh, 70 going to America. Uh, could you give us some idea about the, thing about the thing other 300? Have they had their claims processed? How many of them do you think will go to America? Where would they want to go? I think it's good. Yeah, yeah, I should give you some information about this. So just I wanted to say that we should challenge this government, this policy in new ways, which is uh, focus on uh, these two key points, uh, dollars that they wasted, and another one is playing with the Australian international reputation. So I think it's important. About the number of people, you know, we are uh, 370 people. So 70 people will fly to America. Definitely, they will go to America in less than mm -hmm. two months. So we will become 300 people in Manus. And 50 people are waiting to get results from America. So their process already finished. So uh, we expect accept by America and fly to America in less than four months or less than three months. Uh, so we will become uh, about 200 people, 250 or 200 people in four months. But other people uh, were uh, rejected by America and they didn't explain why, just they told them they don't want to accept you, you are rejected. And above, UG status. So uh, they are not a part of the process. They are not a part of the deal with America. And we should acknowledge this, that about 50, uh, 20 people of these uh, people with negative refugee status didn't process at all, you know, they didn't process them, and they didn't give case to PNG. I think it is the first time in the history that they don't, they didn't, uh, you know, they don't uh, process people at all. So, and I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I didn't give case to PNG, and they didn't. Uh, process me, but they gave me positive. They say you are a. How do you know that I am a refugee? Mm -hmm. I am a genuine refugee. They said we collected information about you in the internet. So and I think the, so. It's so strange. So this process uh, was uh, uh, completely, uh, you know, unfair. Uh, or, uh, was completely wrong, but now, yeah, so 80 people in Manus uh, rejected, you know, they are with negative uh, uh, refugee status. So in Naro, I think about 100 and uh, 70 people are waiting for America to get result, uh, and 70 people uh, will fly to uh, America. So um, about 50 people uh, rejected. So, you know, I think in Manus, we can say that uh, less than 250 people remain in the next four months. And in Nauru, uh, less than 150 people remain. But still, we should think about uh, since the election, 37 people accepted, uh, approved, I mean, 37 people in Manus. So we expect that more people, and you know, right now, I think 27 people are waiting to uh, approve by the minister. So uh, I think each month we should expect that at least 20 people uh, go to Australia on the, under the Medivac law. So in next four months, we will be, PNG, we will be less than 150 people. So if they accept the news and offer, 
it will finish. So, but uh, we should wait to see that this government is willing to solve this problem or not, because they didn't want to solve this problem. And the interesting thing is that they have the results from the America, they have the result, but they refuse to give it to people. You know, so that result and the government, I mean, the Australian government has the result, but is playing with people because they want to keep us here more. They want to waste the time. So hopefully, hopefully they, uh, you know, they re think about it. And this time they you know, solve this problem because solving this problem, it's so easy and uh, the solution is uh, ready to uh, accept that. If they want to solve this problem, the solution is ready. Just I wanted to say that. Uh, Beruz, one little detail. I'm aware of the various people who are being offered places in America, including one person in particular I know called Fahad, you probably know him. He has been offered a place in America, but his wife and children live in Australia. His children are Australian citizens. Are you aware of other people in that same difficult position who might, for personal reasons, want to come to Australia? Yeah, definitely. There are some people, there are some people who have family in Australia, uh, but you know, I think most of them have sisters and uh, brothers. So uh, there are some, but they are not too many people. They are just few people. And uh, they, of course, they want to go to Australia, but they are not too many people. They are not too many people. And I think it's important that we acknowledge this, that this exile policy uh, actually separated many families from uh, each other and many people in Manus are fathers and they have been separated with their families for six years. I think it's important that we acknowledge this but of course there are some uh, special uh, cases so we can work on this so later so if you would like to work on these cases, uh, yeah, I can do some research and get some information and put you in touch with uh, those particular people. Thank you. Um, the, other, the other thing I was interested to find out is we've heard reports in the news in Australia that since the surprise result in the federal election, self-harm and suicides have increased dramatically. What's the position about that now? Yeah, right now, I think it's uh, getting changed. So the number of suicide attempts <clears throat> and self-harm has reduced, uh, which, but uh, still people are depressed. And, you know, sometimes we have some kind of suicide attempts and uh, self-harm but it's not like before it's much better now and uh, another thing I think I forgot to mention is that there are three uh, detention center in Manus Island so uh, they are going to close hillside which is uh, a place for they that they keep the uh, ref, uh, the guys so they transfer uh, 70 of them to Port Mosby and uh, you know the number of people in that camp are about 30 people so they are going to transfer everyone all of them to Port Mosby and we are very concerned that they keep them in prison in Bomana prison in Port Mosby so uh, right now the number of people in Manus uh, are uh, 170 people are in Port Mosby. They are in Granville Motel or they are in PIH Hospital. But definitely they are going to close Hillside in next two weeks and then 
their plan is to close another camp, uh, West House. There are 45 people, so they are going to move all of them, relocate all of them to East Orango camp. So in next months or next two months, uh, we only have one camp in Manus, which is East Orango camp. Uh, detention center. So I think it is a big uh, uh, thing that is happening here. So they are going to close other camps. There is, thank you. It, it is a good time, actually. It is a good time. That's There's a uh, deep irony in your statement, Virus, but thank you. So um, we're going to turn now to Julian and Frank, and then we'll come back to you. Hopefully, we'll still be able to have you connected with us for um, a moderated discussion and questions and answers. So is that okay with you? Is that a yes? <laughs> can you hear me, Beruz? Mm, I cannot hear you well, yeah, unfortunately. That's okay. All right. Well, we're just going to... Beruz, somebody else can talk to Beruz for a moment. We're just going to turn now to um, Julian Burnside first for his keynote. Okay. I um, particularly liked Madeline's um, welcome to country and acknowledgement of the traditional owners. It reminded me, um, where, as you developed it, it reminded me of a cartoon I saw in a book a year or two ago. <clears throat> it was a, an Aboriginal man standing at Sydney Cove looking down at the first fleet which had just arrived, he has a can of British paints in one hand and he scrawled, Stop the Boats. <laughs> <laughs> now, Stop the Boats really started becoming a mantra in 2001 um, when the Tampa episode happened. And it's useful to remember two things about the Tampa episode. First of all, it was a desperate attempt by John Howard uh, to prop up his prospects for the election which had to happen in November that year um, and it worked remarkably well for him. But the second is that the judgment of Justice North in the federal court in the Tampa case was handed down in Melbourne at 2.15 in the afternoon on the 11th of September 2001, just eight hours before the attack on America. And that of course changed the political complexion of it dramatically. Anyway, Stop the Boats became something of a mantra in 2001, but then uh, in 2012, 2013, it became uh, a repeated refrain. In 2013, you may remember Tony Abbott, who used to be our Prime Minister and used to be a Member of Parliament, uh, <laughs> really, really um, um, made put great importance on the notion of stopping the boats. And of course in 2013 the um, offshore processing regime was created. Um, this was, this was uh, announced by Scott Morrison, who used to be a person, and <laughs> Scott Morrison repeatedly said, despite his prominently Christian views, he said that the people on Nauru and Manus, he said to them, you will never be resettled in Australia. Um, he, he, it's an interesting thing about Morrison. Um, Beirut was talking before about how our politicians lie to us. I agree completely, they do. And one of the most dishonest, hypocritical people in parliament is Scott Morrison. He was arguably the worst um, immigration minister we have ever had. Um, worse even than Peter Dutton, and there's a thought to conjure with. Um, and he repeatedly, in, you know, in Scott Morrison's maiden address in Parliament, he actually quoted from the Bible as to, to identify the source of his values. His values, he said, were loving kindness and compassion for other people, and yet he became the most, the cruelest and most explicitly cruel, malevolent uh, um, immigration minister we've ever seen. And uh, I think it's a scandal which our generation will never live down 
that we've just re-elected him as Prime Minister of the country. Um, he is uh, at least in part responsible for the situation I just mentioned to Beruz of Fahad, who is stuck in Manus and has, to his good fortune, been offered a place in America, but his wife and his Australian children live in Australia and he will be separated from his family because of the deliberate policies of our government, which used to pride itself on its family values. Um, the, the, um, the numbers of boat people who've ever come to Australia are astonishingly small. We, we've been persuaded by our dishonest politicians to think that we're under threat of some sort. I mean, renaming the Department of Immigration to the Department of Immigration and Border Protection was a very obvious way of indicating what the government's game was. They reckon that they, by frightening us, they can get extra votes if they offer us protection. And um, the numbers, the maximum number of uh, boat arrivals was in 2012, and that triggered the move to offshore processing the maximum number in any 12-month period in the last however many decades, probably since 1788, the largest number of uninvited boat people coming to Australia was just short of 25,000 in one year. Now, in a country uh, which is fairly big geographically and which is rich by any standards and which has a population of just on 25 million, 25,000 in one year doesn't seem like a hell of a lot. And so it does, uh, it does raise the question, where are we? That's the question in this debate. Where are we? What have we become as a nation that we are prepared to mistreat people deliberately who do exactly what we would do if we were faced with their circumstances? And as Beru said, the cost has been spectacular since... Uh, the Pacific Solution began in its second iteration. It has cost us, it's very easy to say, nine billion, nine thousand million dollars. That's a lot of money to keep a handful of people away from this country. Um, the, uh, the, the numbers at the moment, by my arithmetic, come to about 640 or so, and in um, Senate estimates, I think in 2016, um, the, in order to keep what was then 872 people out of Australia, we had spent $2 billion in that year, $2,000 million in one year to keep 872 people away. It's an obscene waste of taxpayers' money. And I wish for many reasons that our present treasurer would notice that. Um, the, uh, the the fact is that most of the people who've been pushed offshore by our government have been assessed as genuine refugees entitled to protection, entitled legally to protection. Calling them illegal is just part of the dishonesty of this government. They don't break any law by coming here the way they do. They exercise the right which we have recognised for decades. Um, we were despite our small size at the end of the Second World War, we were an important contributor to Eleanor Roosevelt's um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights recognises every human being's right to seek asylum. And the... Uh, the uh, Refugees Convention, which we accepted in, I think, 1954, um, links perfectly well with the right offered by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, why is it that in the last two decades we have, as a country, decided to behave as badly, as conspicuously badly as we do to people who've done nothing worse than just ask to be protected from persecution? Um, it's astounding. The The answer that is sometimes given is that we have to do it or or what? Um, 
Last year, I think it was, Australia reached an interesting demographic tipping point. There are now more people in Australia older than 45 than people younger than 45. Now, that's got all sorts of demographic implications. We need younger people in this country. 51% of the world's refugees are under 18 years old. Virtually all of the people currently on Manus and Nauru are under 45. We need people like that. There is, there is a, a man on Manus who, or I don't know if he's gone to America yet, but he, um, he recently said that he is uh, a nuclear physicist and a mathematician and he's trying to keep his brain active and keep his maths alive. Two plus two equals five, he said. Um, the, the fact is that the people who've been pushed away to Nauru, just on 80% of them have been assessed by the Nauruans, trained by us, assessed as refugees. 82% uh, of the people on Manus have been assessed by the Papua New Guineans as refugees. These are not people who are simply trying to take a lend of us. They're not economic migrants. They are people escaping persecution. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most astonishing ironies of recent Australian politics that a couple of years ago on Manus, uh, Rohingya men were being offered $25,000 in cash if they would return to Myanmar. And the fact is, I mean, everyone knows now what what is the fate of the Rohingyans in Myanmar. It's like saying to a Jew in the 19, late 1930s, here's some money, go back to Germany, you'll be okay. It's breathtaking. And it has got to the point now where many of you will recognise it's embarrassing, if you're overseas, it's embarrassing to identify yourself as Australian because the question will often be asked, what on earth do you people think you're doing, the way you're treating refugees? Now. Um, if it's not bad enough that the government is lying to us in order to cover the ugliest details, which would probably persuade most Australians that what we're doing is wrong, um, the fact is that there is a simple alternative. Uh, you may recall um, Sean Hands, who uh, worked for five years with the Department of Immigration. He published a piece in the Monthly in November last year, and um, he has jumped ship. He went to Nauru. Um, he says, I met a man who started to shake up my faith in the system. This was whilst Sean Hands was still working for the department. Um, he was essentially the same as the man I'd interviewed in my first year working with the department. His eyes were constantly unfocused. He was only ever partially present. I saw pictures of him in his life before Nauru. They showed a happy man, almost unrecognisable, compared with the gaunt, haunted apparition now in front of me. Nothing I knew about this, his past would explain his transformation. He hadn't been tortured, he hadn't suffered sexual assault, he didn't claim to have suffered anything particularly traumatic in his home country. The conclusion was inescapable. We had done this to him. We had so effectively destroyed a man that he wasn't just indistinguishable from the torture victim, he was indistinguishable from the most damaged torture victim I've ever encountered, and I've interviewed many. Now, that is what we are doing, and that is what we ought to be ashamed of, and it's what we will recognise, I hope, at some point, when this present lot running the government get turfed out. What we need to do is to persuade our local members that there is an alternative. One of the points that Sean Hands makes is that if we shut down offshore processing, it will not restart the boats. Um, and that's because there's a sort of ring of steel which is responsible for hundreds of boat turnbacks. Um, and the fact is that most of the people smugglers in Indonesia cannot offer um, uh, an effective escape from persecution to their would-be customers. So, here's an alternative. Shut down offshore processing for good and for all. It is outrageously cruel, it is absurdly expensive, and it is disgracing this country. It is ruining our reputation as a country. It is not what Australians ought to be doing. So, shut down offshore processing, and then assume against all the evidence that the boats do restart. Let's assume that. 
Uh, and let's assume that the arrival rate rockets up to the historic maximum, 25,000 in one year, and let's suppose that becomes a new normal arrival rate. I would say if that happens, then by all means, if you think mandatory detention is necessary, then put them in detention for a maximum of one month. Use that one month for preliminary health and security checks, which is a reasonable precaution for any country. Uh, at the end of that month, give them an interim visa, which allows them to live in the community and has a number of conditions. First, they're allowed to work. Second, they're allowed full access to Centrelink and Medicare benefits. Third, they have to stay in regular contact with the department so they can't just evaporate. So, for example, they could report to a post office once a week. And fourth, crucially, until their refugee status is finally determined, they must live in a specified regional town or city. Now, if you, if you imagine, if you assume for a moment that the arrival rate is 25,000 people per year, and if you assume against all the evidence that all of them stay on full Centrelink benefits for the whole time, the fact is that that would cost hundreds of millions of dollars or less than we're spending at the moment locking them up. Furthermore, we would stop harming people and start doing good for them. Third, all of that Centrelink money would be spent in regional towns and cities because when, you, when you're on Centrelink and you've paid some rent and you've bought some food and you've bought some clothing, there's not much left over. We could actually repair the damage which we have done to innocent human beings, we could help them, we could help regional Australia, and we could save billions of dollars a year by the simple, by the simple mechanism of shutting down offshore processing and treating people decently when they arrive in this country asking for protection. And that, I would like to say, is what this country ought to be doing. It's what we could do, and it's what we are. At least I hope it's what we are. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. We're turning over to Frank Brennan now. Good evening, everyone. The organisers of this evening's event have posed a number of questions for us. I dare say that our answers would have been somewhat different if the result of the federal election was somewhat different. But with the re-election of the Morrison Coalition Government, I will have no hesitation in putting a position somewhat at variance from my co-panellists, one of whom was a candidate for the Greens in the recent election, and the other of whom is a long-standing resident of Manus Island, hoping against hope to make it one day to Australia. Our gathering this evening will be a success if we can work towards practical answers capable of adoption by the Morrison government and tailored to ensuring that we do not have to face a fourth federal election with Australia's cruel treatment of asylum seekers on Pacific Islands being a backdrop to the electoral prospects of the Coalition and the Labor Party. I invite you to imagine the scene on Saturday the 20th of July 2013, six years ago. I'd been in Myanmar out of reach for the week. On the previous afternoon, the then Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, announced his Papua New Guinea solution to the increased flow of boat people heading to Australia seeking asylum. He declared that all boat people headed for Australia would be moved to Papua New Guinea for processing and ultimate resettlement with the guarantee that they would never reach Australia. Landing in Sydney, my first telephone conversation was with Paris Aristotle, the refugee advocate who's been an advisor to Australian governments of all political persuasions. Knowing that I was a friend of Rudd, Paris said to me, Frank, you are never to leave the country again without permission. <laughs> I then spent a few hours writing a critical assessment of the government proposal, publishing it immediately on the internet. In part, this is what I wrote. Since the Houston panel reported in 2012, it's been very clear that all major political parties in Australia 
are of the unshakable view that there's a world of difference between an asylum seeker in direct flight from persecution, seeking a transparent determination of their refugee claim, which if successful, will result in the grant of a temporary protection, and an asylum seeker prepared to risk life and fortune to engage a people smuggler to obtain not just temporary protection, but permanent resettlement in First World Australia. With the rapid increase in the number of boat people arriving from Indonesia this past two years and the corresponding increase in deaths at sea, I've been one refugee advocate prepared to concede this distinction, though claiming that the line is often difficult to draw. The line could be more drawn more compellingly if there was a basic level of processing and protection in Indonesia, Malaysia and throughout the region which could be endorsed by the UNHCR. This is a work which would require a lot of painstaking high-level diplomacy and it definitely cannot be done before the 2013 election. I concluded, in the short term, no government will stop the boats unless there's a clear message sent to people smugglers and people waiting in Indonesia to board boats. But that message must propose a solution which is both workable and basically fair, maintaining the letter and spirit of the Refugee Convention and Australian law. I then boarded another plane and flew to Brisbane for a social event at the Prime Minister's home. Being ushered into the Prime Ministerial study, I was able to say that I had already published my view on the new policy. Rad and I, being friends, agreed that we had our distinctive tasks and duties to perform. We had a one-hour robust conversation, which I will never repeat. But he concluded the conversation in these terms. Frank, you've got to do what you've got to do, and I've got to do what I've got to do. These enigmatic words I've taken to be the most insightful appraisal of the last six years' standoff between government and refugee advocates. Ever since, I've continued asking what are the ethical and legal preconditions for Australia being able to turn back the boats. Many refugee advocates continue to be upset with me and my fellow proponents, Robert Mann, who's here this evening, John Menadieu and Tim Costello, for conceding that any such discussion is theoretically possible, let alone practically necessary. Prime Minister Rudd issued a challenge to all refugee advocates and social justice groups when he appeared on national television in the lead up to the 2013 Australian election, when he spoke about a people smuggler being interviewed by a media outlet, saying that this was a fundamental assault on their business model. Rudd said, the challenge that I put out to anyone who asks that we should consider a different approach is this. What would you do to stop thousands of people, including children, drowning offshore, other than undertake a policy direction like this? What is the alternative answer? We have now all endured our third election in a row when boat turnbacks and the punitive treatment of refugees and asylum seekers has featured. The overwhelming majority of our politicians and the overwhelming majority of voters are agreed that the boats from Indonesia carrying asylum seekers transiting Indonesia should be stopped and the refugees and asylum seekers who have been languishing on Nauru and Manus Island should be treated decently and humanely. The disagreement is over whether after six years of aimless waiting and suspension, all those who are sick can be given appropriate medical attention either on site or in Australia. A recent swathe of court cases demonstrates that when the decision whether to conduct a medical evacuation is left to Mr Dutton's public servants, the decision cannot always be classed as decent and humane. A narrow majority of our politicians thought it was time to insist that such medical decisions always be decent and humane. They remain insistent that the boats remain stopped with turnbacks in place. In February this year, when Jacinta Collins, the manager of opposition business in the Senate, announced her retirement from Parliament, she made a telling observation that got very little coverage at the time. She told the Senate, I regret the officials did not alert Labor when we were in government that boat interceptions or turnbacks could safely occur. Much of what followed 
might not have subsequently occurred. At the 2013 election, Rudd and Abbott had been equally committed to stopping the boats. While Abbott placed great store on turnbacks, Rudd thought the same result could be achieved only by other means, including the revival of the Pacific Solution, but with the added proviso that no one would ever be permitted to resettle in Australia. He negotiated deals with Papua New Guinea and Nauru and announced that no asylum seeker taken to those places would ever be permitted to settle in Australia. Rudd, presumably with comprehensive security and military briefings, thought that the conditions for legal turnbacks could not be fulfilled. Abbott, without the benefit of the regular briefings available only to government, was able to wing it and promise turnbacks. On his election as Prime Minister, Abbott instituted Operation Sovereign Borders. Many of us were troubled by the secrecy of the turnback arrangements because the previous year, the expert panel chaired by the respected ex-head of the military, Angus Houston, had reported that the conditions necessary for effective, lawful and safe turnback of irregular vessels carrying asylum seekers to Australia are not currently met. So, what has changed? We know that one thing has changed is that the Labor Party at the 2015 National Conference decided to accept the reality of turnbacks. We, the public, have been left still none the wiser as to whether Angus Houston's preconditions for turnbacks have been fulfilled. The pressure on the ALP resulted in a change of policy at their conference. Bill Shorten won the day, gaining an endorsement for safe turnbacks. His opponents, including Albanese, Plibersek and Wong, but Shorten was able to build a united front, telling the media, we've had our debates in public, the Labor Party really argued this through, and I'm pleased to say that they backed my call. Since then, Labor has been able to put itself forward with a bipartisan commitment to stopping the boats safely. So, here we are now with a situation where there is still eight to 900 refugees and asylum seekers remaining on Nauru and Manus Island. And there are many who have come from Nauru and Manus Island to Australia to receive medical treatment. Those who have been screened out and found not to be refugees need to accept that the re-elected Morrison government will not allow them to settle permanently in Australia. Those from Iran who have been found not to be refugees cannot be returned home by force. They need to choose to return home. Those who have been found to be refugees should be resettled promptly, either in the United States or in New Zealand. There are no other practical options. Australia should stop pressuring Nauru and New Zealand from agreeing to the regular transfer of 150 refugees per annum. For too long, the Australian government has tried to have it both ways. Only last week, Minister Dutton informed the Australian Parliament, in general, the government's position is that Australia does not exercise the degree of control necessary in regional processing countries to enliven Australia's international obligations. So, what right does Australia have to exercise that degree of control necessary to stop the transfer of refugees from those regional processing countries to a country where a decent, durable solution might be provided. If Nauru and New Zealand, or Papua New Guinea and New Zealand, are minded to reach agreement on putting an end to a humanitarian disaster, what business is that of Australia, just because Australia caused the disaster in the first place? Should any of those proven to be refugees not be acceptable to the United States or New Zealand, then they should be resettled in Australia promptly, provided only they do not constitute a security risk in Australia. Now, some of us are citizens inspired and motivated by religious insights, and we're told that Mr. Morrison is one of them. So maybe things like the parable of the Good Samaritan or the call to a jubilee year might resonate. Others of us are very inspired by international law and some of the norms of international law as they are developed by legal academics. 
and they might be seen to be often just as idealistic as those of us of a religious persuasion. Others of us are not international lawyers, we don't claim to be religious, but we do have an ideal about treating people decently and humanely. Now, it's a brave commentator who suggests what makes moral, political and economic good sense to the Morrison government on these issues. After all, they were prepared to waste over $180 million prior to the recent election opening or reopening the Christmas Island processing facility with no one to be processed. And it would seem that this form of economic waste and bad policy passes muster with the electorate when it would not if the money were wasted so profitably on other government non-services designed only for mandate signaling. But let me have a go. Any government, including the re-elected Morrison government, should see the good sense in providing employment, health and welfare services for bona fide asylum seekers living in the Australian community having adequately resourced the non-military, non-customs part of the Department of Home Affairs to process promptly those on our shores who are applying for protection visas simply so as to extend their time in Australia on a visitor's visa. As has been made clear in recent days, those who lie about the need for protection are not those who come by boat. They are people who come on visitor visas or business visas, particularly from countries like Malaysia, and then on payment of $100, know that they can extend their stay in this country by simply applying for a protection visa when, of course, none would be warranted. Any government, including the re-elected Morrison government, should see the good sense in allowing proven refugees on temporary protection visas to transit to a permanent visa after, say, six or perhaps nine years. Any government, including the re-elected Morrison government, should see the good sense in resolving the caseload of refugees and asylum seekers languishing on Nauru and Manus Island after six years and three elections while keeping the boat stopped, turning back those who are not fleeing persecution in Indonesia and conducting on-water assessments of those travelling from countries like Vietnam and Sri Lanka, which are not presently significant refugee-producing countries. Any government, including the re-elected Morrison government, should appreciate that the Australian Senate will not vote for legislation which would force children who are proven refugees brought to Australia for family medical care, including psychiatric help, to be removed back to Nauru to languish in ongoing existential despair after six years of waiting and in the spurious name of sending a signal to people smugglers. Those refugee children and their families will have to be allowed to remain in Australia unless a ready removal to the USA or New Zealand can be arranged. After six years, the time might even come when the party room of the Liberal Party will say that this is more than enough cruelty, regardless of the political advantage in providing an ongoing ready point of differentiation from the Labor Party. Failed asylum seekers whose refugee claims have been refused in Nauru or Papua New Guinea should abandon hope that the re-elected Morrison government will allow them to settle in Australia. They will not. I acknowledge that these suggestions are unlikely to be completely acceptable to my fellow panellists, but as we heard at the outset, we're invited here this evening to express robust differences of opinion. Julian and I have the advantage of having both commenced at the Melbourne Bar 40 years ago, so we know how to be perfectly civil in disagreement. <laughs> but I do ask my fellow panellists to acknowledge that anything more than this will never win acceptance from the re-elected Morrison government and is unlikely to win support from the Albanese opposition. Let's maintain our idealism, our religious fervour and our faith in international law and norms. But let's all commit to options with some hope of winning acceptance by those who expect to occupy the Treasury benches and let's not hold out false hopes 
to those who continue to languish in Nauru and Manus Island. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. And so now we're going to turn to having a discussion between the three of us, and I get to ask some questions. And I think what we've heard from Frank, Julian, and Beirouz tonight is different forms of hope, if you like, that the situation in Manus Island is going to come to an end. So Beirouz is very practical, then this is a numbers game, and these numbers are somehow going to diminish. <laughs> Julian presented us with a much bigger picture of hope, a hope that somehow Australia can overcome its commitment to strong borders, a commitment really that it's had since Federation. Uh, and Frank's is somewhere in the middle, a plea to the government to do something because this situation is so desperate. And so my question to the three of you, and Baruz, perhaps we'll start with you and then move to the other two, is where do you find this hope? So one of the ways that we can think about the Morrison government, and in particular Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton, is as completely absolutist in their positions. They want to stop the boats. We need strong borders. There doesn't ever appear to be a chink in that absolutist armour. So my question is, and Beruz, I'll start with you, where do you find hope that this situation can be resolved? Yeah, I think the, the, we should acknowledge this, that uh, they have kept us here. I think the, you know, and we committed no crime. So that's why, and also so far, 60 or 70 percent of people released from Manus Island and Nauru. So that, uh, I think that showed that, uh, they should do something and uh, the number of people reduced. So that's why I think, you know, they, they should do something. And also, also the election is over. We are living uh, in, uh, after the elections. So the election finished. So, uh, you know, they don't have political benefits anymore to keep us here. So that's why, you know, the, if we look at this policy in a logical way, they should uh, do something and close these camps. Although we should acknowledge this, that the, this government is, you know, I don't want to use a stupid word, but, you know, they, they have done logical things over the past six years. But I think we should be hopeful uh, the, and also the PNG government is putting pressure on Australia. Uh, they are not happy with this policy and the local people are not happy. The local authorities are not happy with this policy. So that's why I think that they should do uh, something. And, uh, you know, and we have the Medivac law. Medivac law and yeah, already I told you that so far 37 people from Manus uh, have got uh, released from this island since the election. And so far, I think more than 50 people from Manus went to Australia and 27 people are waiting to get uh, on this week or next week. So, you know, I think in next four months, most of people will release from uh, Manus Island and just uh, 150 people remain. So on that time, I think it is the uh, put pressure on the government to accept the New Zealand offer. Because on that time, if the number of people reduced to 150, the government cannot justify public that they keep us here because because of the are coming. So only by 150 people. So, and also, you know, we should do some political lobbying in the, the parliament that they pass a bill or, you know, make a law that we never go to Australia. We are completely happy with that. If they accept New Zealand offer and make a law that we never go to Australia, you know, 99% of the refugees in Manusala and Nauru are happy with that. What is important for us, 
is to get off the main point and the only thing that we are struggling for. So, you know, but I am sure, I am sure that the history will make judge about this uh, parties, political parties, about this exile policy and on future, I am sure that Australian public will be in shock by hearing more about uh, so much money in this island, how about the corruption, about the, you know, inhuman policy, about this barbaric policy. And uh, I am sure about that. So uh, if someone like me, if I get freedom, my next step, you know, I will work to, uh, you know, the about Royal Commission. Royal Commission should involve in this uh, issue, in this uh, and people the right to know what the their government has done in Manusana and Nauru. And I am sure that Australian public will be in shock, although there are enough materials, movies, books, news, articles, documents, everything about this policy. And if anyone, you know, you know, in Australia says that I don't know or we don't know what the government is doing, we don't know that what the has done. I think it is completely unacceptable. People should do some research to reach to many documents, uh, uh, writing, artworks, everything about this policy and about the life in Manus Island uh, and Nauru, about the, this systematic torture and about what the government has done in Manus Island so, and Nauru. So I think it is unacceptable. So people just should do some research, uh, research to know what has happened in Manusan and Nauru. But I think we should be hopeful, just I know that. And we know how, because well, what I feel is that uh, after the election, perhaps I'm right, wrong, but after the election, I feel that the civil society in Australia, uh, you know, getting weak and they are not active as much as before. You know, it is my feeling, perhaps I am wrong, but my request and my message is that we know in front of a fascist government with fascist uh, mentality, we know have choice fight back against this uh, system. It is my understanding after six years living in this place, and I am not an idealist person. Uh, you, you are aware of these circumstances and you know that oh, we have been suffering in Manus Island, but and I'm not idealist, you know. What I understand is that we should fight against uh, this government beliefs. And Australian people, Many people are not happy when I call this government fascist government. They say this government is not fascist and you are uh, assaulting us. But I believe in that. So I don't say that the Australian government is fascist in Australia. In some ways is uh, fascist, but in Manusana and Nauru is worse than fascism. You know, so far, two people died in these islands by this government and hundreds of people physically and mentally. And they have kept us here while we committed no crime. So of course it is fascism and I insist on that and I emphasize on that and I work on this, you know, that this government is fascist. And yeah, sorry, you know, I, when I talk I, in the events, people say that you make us feel uncomfortable, but I think I should feel, uh, make people feel uncomfortable. If I don't do that, it means I am not doing my work in the right way. You know, my work is that, my work is that to share this, trage uh, this tragedy, 
to tell this story to people, not only in Australia, people around the world. And I will continue and I will work in this way. So just I want to, to say that. So always we should be hopeful. Always we should be hopeful. Yeah, there is no choice. Thank you, Beres. <laughs> Beres, I don't know if you could hear that, but people just gave you a round of applause. Um, so may, I, may I say something? Please. I know the idea of this is that we're meant to disagree with each other. I want to say one thing which I think no one will disagree with, not Frank, not you, not Beres, and that is I'm sorry for what we have done to you. And I'm yes. sorry for what we've done to all your friends. Thank you. We couldn't survive here without the Australian people's support. I know a big part of the Australian people have supported us. Uh, and yeah, I think we should recognize that, that a big part of the Australian society uh, have supported us. And yeah, I really appreciate people who stand up for humanity and it is not only standing up for refugees' rights, it is fighting for your people too, for Australia. Thank you, uh, there is. Injustice. Yeah. You are fighting for human rights, so that's why it is not only for the refugees. It is for Australia, it is for the next gener generations, and I think it, it's important. I am sure history will make judge about this dark period. Frank. You've asked about where we find hope. Now, as Bruce has made clear, the numbers are now manageable on Nauru and Manus Island. I would be more hopeful if Labor were elected, not for what you might think of the usual reasons, but it was a Labor government that created this problem in 2013. And so I think there were a sufficient number of people in the Labor Party who wanted to put it all behind them and to so the country could move on. I think there are still people in the coalition who basically say Labor created this problem and we just don't have to do anything. So that tempers my hope, but my hope is centred on just two particular lights. One is that where last week, as I said, Peter Dutton told the Parliament that we don't have any control over what goes on in these countries. That's and that's why we have no international law <laughs> obligations. Well, if that's the case, then if New Zealand wants to cut a deal with Nauru or, or with Papua New Guinea, take 150 a year, none of our business but out of it, Mr Dutton, but out of it, Foreign Minister Payne, but out of it, Prime Minister Morrison. That's the first But you point. know, that was said. Yeah. Yeah. And the second, and second point of hope is, as Bruce has pointed out, there are now more of the cohort from Nauru and Manus Island who are actually living in Australia, they and their families receiving medical care, than there are in Nauru and Manus Island. There is no way the Australian public and the Australian Senate will stand for law changes or policy directions that will result in one proven refugee child who has languished for six years on those places is now safely here in Australia. There is no way that unions will load an aeroplane or that the public will wear that a child could be sent back to Nauru rather than just being resettled in New Zealand or the United States. And if they're not going to be resettled in New Zealand or the United States, they have to remain here and they have to be allowed to get on and live their lives with a sense of permanence henceforth. Julian, hope. Hmm? Hope. Um, I, my hope, I think, comes from a sense that Australians generally are decent people. And if we're allowed to know the facts, we will force the government to behave properly. And I, what, what else can I do? I mean, are we all terrible? Are we all just little imitations of Peter Dutton? <laughs> if we are, we've got a problem. 
and I hope New Zealand will let me go there. <laughs> so, one more question before I open it up to you, and it, it comes to the specific question about turnbacks and, and Frank's suggestion that the, the argument that um, if the people who are currently detained on Manus Anuru are allowed to leave and turnbacks remain, that the government might, this government might be convinced to pass legislation or to allow that situation to happen. Um, and both Frank and Julian, you've alluded to the lack of information about turnbacks. And um, I think, Frank, you talked about um, Angus... Now I'm going to forget his name, how hideous. Angus Houston. Thank you. Angus Houston's Angus requirement Houston. that turnbacks were... Safe, effective. transparent and legal. Yeah, transparent and legal. So given the absence of information, how do we know that the turnbacks will, will do that, will be that, are that? We don't know that, and that's why part what we have to negotiate is an insurance that there will be that transparency to the parliament. And I think that's got to be a precondition as they come to debate the Medivac bill or whatever. I would hope that some of those crossbenchers, I mean, it was nice to hear Jackie Lambie say she's in no position to decide on this at the moment. She needs more information and she'd been talking to a doctor who'd just been in Nauru. So I would hope crossbenchers like that would be demanding that there be more information provided to the parliament in an orderly fashion. But having said that, I am one who concedes that a lot of the very fine international law arguments that get put, uh, they're fine international law arguments, but they don't cut it in terms of Australian domestic law or Australian domestic politics. And most Australians, I think, get it that people who come on boats from Indonesia are not fleeing persecution in Indonesia. And so what they are seeking is a more benign outcome and that the way to deal with that is with a more comprehensive regional set of agreements. And the turnbacks issue is simply one aspect of that. And don't forget also the Refugees Convention was intended to share, to share the load. So that the idea that you have to stop in the first available safe place is absolute nonsense. It simply contradicts the reason we signed the Refugees Convention. Beirouz, do you have a view on turnbacks? Did you hear us? Did you hear me? No. Beirouz might think that six years spent in Indonesia would have been better than six years in Manus. He was in Indonesia for some time before he left. But, um, okay. But that'll be the consequence of a turnback. And as for turnbacks, it's also important to remember the reason we don't know anything about it is because Scott Morrison, when he was, when he was immigration minister, repeatedly referred to bits of information which were not available to us, namely on water matters. Remember the on water matters thing? You know, there's, that, there's that big area of stuff you're just not allowed to know about because we can't trust you, the public. Yes, and all of which comes back to the question about absolutism, but you all have your sources of hope and that's reassuring in some ways. Um, so I think we will open up to the audience now. So there are two microphones or two people with microphones positioned in the room. Uh, and there are a couple of requirements in relation to your questions, please. So the first is that you just say your name, please. And the second is that you ask a question into the microphone because this is being recorded uh, and live streamed. It is likely that I will need to repeat your question so that Beruz can hear me, hopefully he can hear it. Uh, and if you could keep your questions reasonably brief and if you could ask a question rather than make a statement, uh, that would be really wonderful. So I think there's one here. My question is to Beruz and the panel. Beruz, you will recall the death of Hamid Karzai. He was, his flight was delayed and he arrived brain dead in a Brisbane hospital in August 2014. My question to you is, what if within three weeks criminal charges were laid by the Commonwealth Health and Safety Authority, Comcare, alleging breaches, criminal breaches of Australian workplace law, namely failure to 
proactively look after the health of Hamid Karzai. Would that make a difference? Beruz, did you hear that question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I cannot hear you well. Just I heard something about Hamid Kazai. So the question... So if it's possible... In, yeah. The question was, what would you think um, of the possibility of having criminal charges laid in Australia in relation to the death of Hamid Kazai under workplace um, laws? Do you think that would make a difference to your situation in Manus? Yeah, unfortunately, I cannot hear you well. Yeah. So the um, alternative in this situation is that we're going to text the questions to Beruz because we also have him on WhatsApp, um, and we're going to if hope that possible, he can read them. Yeah. You, yeah, we're going to text yeah, you. We're going to text you, you the questions. He can't hear me. Are you? But in the meantime, while Alice is sending the questions to Beruz, I will take another question for Julian or Frank. There's someone at the back, yes. Okay. I don't want to really mention my name. Uh, excuse me for that. But I also consider myself as someone a uh, victim of mandatory detention center. I came by boat in 2013. But also, when I came to this country, I was a lawyer. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm studying law and in my final year in this country. Uh, the panel is actually discussed about what is actually happening in relation to asylum seekers in this country in relation to international law. Australia, one of the countries, often sign international convention, but they never implement international convention. So they always really easy for them to sign international convention and they completely ignore the international convention. One of the things I also consider in relation to asylum seeker, uh, asylum seeker issue in Australia Technically, even the High Court, when it's actually determining one of the significant cases in relation to definite, indefinite detention centers, completely disregard human right law. So basically, I don't believe if the international law is not binding, I don't believe the international law is that significant to make any change in relation to asylum seekers issue in this country. Thank the you. government is completely in moral panic. So my question is, what is the other alternative in relation to resolving this issue? Because this issue should be resolved within the government by legislating law to change the mistreatment of asylum seekers in this country because international law has no influence whatsoever in relation to what happening to asylum seekers uh, in different detention centers. And I also believe, uh, in rela uh, you mentioned, I don't have to make comment, but. Yes, so can you ask your question? I think we've got it. What happens in the absence of any impact of international law in Australia, how can this question be resolved? Is that a fair characterization of your question? Absolutely. So, great. So I might turn it over to Frank and Julian. Well, I agree with you. International law is not all it's cracked up to be, particularly when it comes to the treatment of asylum seekers in Australia. Uh, great little new book just come out, Refugee Rights and Policy Wrongs by Jane McAdam and Fiona Chong. Uh, they outline all the international law stuff. And as I intimated in my remarks, a lot of it is like statements of ideals. So for someone like myself from a religious background, I'm used to the parable of the Good Samaritan or the Jubilee year or whatever, but it ain't the domestic law. Now, McAdam's book quotes at 171, the High Court recently, Justice Keane saying, Australian courts are bound to apply Australian statute law 
even if that law should violate a rule of international law. So you've got it there in one sentence. The highest court in the land have said, all very well to know what these wonderful international lawyers are saying, but it just doesn't cut the mustard when it comes to interpreting the statutory law of Australia, which stands on its own. So you're dead right. There is a problem there, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't lose sight of the idealism and the moral compass that can be provided by the norms of international law to hold us to account as a nation and particularly to make adverse moral judgments of politicians who institute legislation inconsistent with international law. So keep hold of that. I think it's worth um, picking up on just one observation you made. You referred to human rights law. We do not have any human rights law in Australia. We have all sorts of provisions which result in um, international legal conventions being denied or not followed in Australian courts for the reasons that Frank just said. Frank uh, led the inquiry in, what, 2012? 2009. Nine, sorry, into whether Australia should have a Charter of Human Rights. Not a constitutional one, just a statutory one. And my understanding is that you weren't in favour of the idea at first. It's probably why they chose I, you. I was offensive, Julian. Yes. But I, I was yeah. converted when he, I heard he was what the public That's, had to say. That is my point. He was converted. <laughs> if you have a law which says that there are certain human rights, like we have in Victoria and they have in the ACT, and I understand they're thinking about getting it in Queensland. They've got it in Queensland. They've got it already. Come in. Yeah. Well yeah. done. Um, <laughs> Um, despite that being Kevin Rudd's <laughs> uh, it the, Unfortunately, Kevin Rudd decided unilaterally that he would not go along with the recommendation that Frank had made, uh, which is why we don't have a Human Rights Act or Charter in the federal sphere in Australia. We desperately need it because most human rights abuses are happening as a result of Commonwealth law. Now, the idea is not very radical. The solution that we've got in Victoria is a very modest Charter of Human Rights, and you can at least say it's done no harm. It has done some good, I think. It has not turned out to be a, a feast for lawyers, which is probably, I think, one of the biggest worries that people have about human rights protection is that it might, it might ultimately benefit lawyers, which would be a horrible idea. Um, if we're going to be serious about human rights, we're the only Western nation in the world that does not have uh, legal protection of human rights. We need legal protection of human rights against which standards other legislation can be assessed. And if you're interested in that debate, the one on August the 13th <laughs> is the debate to come to. I'm going to see if Beruz can hear us again. We think the connection may have dropped out completely. Beruz, can you hear me? Have you, I'm just trying to find out if he's even seen the questions that we've sent through. He has. Beruz, can you answer your questions? We're doing secret communication up the front via WhatsApp. I'll give you a running commentary. We might just give him a moment to see if he sees it. No, it's not looking likely. Are there any other questions? There's one in the middle here. There. Thank you. Um, so I'm Leo and I thank La Trobe Uni here. I'm from Adelaide over here and I'm privileged to be here. My question to the panel is that as a young student in year 12, what are the possibilities that we can do to help this situation? because it is seen with Greta Thunberg, who led the climate change thing, that this was not knocked about greatly by the politicians to say that they should be in school rather than fighting for the climate. So I ask whether if there's any opportunities we can do at our schools to help this situation and what are the opportunities are further on tertiary and outside of school in the community. Thank you. <laughs> A short, simple answer, by the next election you'll be allowed to vote. <laughs> Make sure you do. 
and, and make sure and ask your local member and whoever is standing against that person what their position is on matters like this. And if they don't give an acceptable answer, do not vote for them. And make it clear that that is the consequence of them not answering the question in a way that is acceptable. And how fantastic that you as a Year 12 guy turn out to something like this. And mm. next time, bring six of your mates. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think I can speak for the rest of us on the panel. We're sick to death of speaking to people who are well above that 45-year <laughs> bracket that Julian referred to. And we know that your generation care and care passionately. And so more information and more organisation together across generations would do a power of good for this country. So congratulations. Mm. So I'm sorry to say that we appear to have completely lost the connection with Beruz. He can't hear us and we can't hear him. So my apologies for that in relation to people who had wanted to ask Beruz a question specifically. Um, but we still have Frank and Julian here and there's another question at the back there. Uh, th thanks for the opportunity. My name is Dr. Imran Mazuk. I'm a GP who uh, has worked on Nauru, uh, Nauru Christmas Island, uh, Northern Territory detention centres all over the place over the last six, seven years uh, in varying amounts of time. Um, I started off my work uh, with the feelings of Julian and I've currently changed to feelings more that are in line with Frank. Um, in terms of hope and practicality. Uh, in my last time on Nauru, my question is more of a legal one. Not being a lawyer, I'd like to pick your brains on this. Um, since there are people on those two islands who are now deemed to be refugees, um, and they are not um, under the jurisdiction of Australian law, uh, my understanding with international law or uh, refugee convention law is that refugees are allowed to be issued a Geneva passport travel document um, which are under the jurisdiction of the country they reside in. So what is the reason why refugees on those two islands are not uh, able to avail themselves of these documents and travel? I suspect that the the real answer to that is a pragmatic one. Uh, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea get millions and millions of dollars from Australia. In Nauru, for example, um, they get, I think it's two and a half thousand dollars per month per refugee as the cost of the visas which they have given to the refugees. They want the money and they'll do whatever Australia tells them to do. Australia, for its own political reasons that we've discussed, wants those people to languish there as an example to others who might uh, be prepared to risk their lives to get to a place of safety. Um, but it's, it's dirty backroom politics, I think, that will determine what happens. Now, it's interesting, there was a, a judgment that Frank and I were discussing a moment ago. Um, a federal court judge recently gave a massive serve to the Australian government for not um, using its best endeavours to persuade Nauru to allow a person to be brought to Australia for medical treatment who'd been assessed remotely as needing medical treatment. The Nauru government said, well, look, uh, we, we, won't allow, we won't allow that person to be moved because they have not been assessed in the way that we say they should be assessed. They, they won't allow, for example, assessment by video link. And, um, and the judge in the federal court went ballistic at the Commonwealth's representative saying, well, you've done what you were legally um, obliged to do, but you haven't done everything you could do to persuade Nauru to behave. Now, that takes me back to another point that Frank made earlier, which is the... Uh, the response, you know, the fact is it is independent decision of New Zealand on the one hand and Nauru and Papua New Guinea on the other hand, whether visas are given to allow those people to go to New Zealand. And Peter Dutton, I hesitate to say the name, but um, Peter Dutton said at the time, of course it's a matter entirely for them, but they should be aware of the consequences 
of their trade with Australia. Now, that's just a very visible example of the sort of influence which Australia is able to exert in order to get its own way. I could give a personal example from many years ago when the Pacific Solution was first instituted by Howard and Ruddick. I had a visa to visit Nauru. I had a ticket issued by a very good travel agent in Sydney. He came to see me late at night before I was to fly the next morning. He said, Frank, this has never happened to me before. I've been contacted by the airline to tell me that your visa has been cancelled and you cannot travel tomorrow. So I wrote one of my regular letters to Philip Ruddick. At my next meeting with Ruddick, he said to me, I can assure you that neither I nor my department blackballed you, but I cannot speak for Alexander. And Alexander <laughs> at the time was the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mm. Ah, okay. So the question about Hamid Karzai, um, and then I think Arnold Zabel has a question down the front. So yeah. if we could have a microphone down here. Please. The mistreatment of Hamid Karzai's um, circumstances was terrible. Um, I think it would be good if criminal prosecutions could be brought. Um, you'd want to make sure that the evidence was there. Uh, the the facts are now fairly old, um, but. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the work health and safety legislation that can be used. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, this, if Max offers you a standard form letter on your departure, make sure and take it and read it carefully and send it off. Because the idea that we can have criminal prosecutions of the government for offshore, offshore misbehaviour that has work health and safety implications is looks legally sound to me, and I think it might make an impact on this government. Um, Frank, did you want to say anything? Well beyond my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> Arnold. Uh, in some ways, I feel we've been snookered in this debate, and I'm prompted to ask this question for a number of reasons, but partly in response to the Year 12 student um, and, and what I sense coming from him. And, Granted that we there is a kind of numbers game uh, and that Beirut has very, very uh, succinctly uh, explained how this uh, uh, situation can be resolved very quickly uh, and, and um, get the people that are remaining off. But I also think there is a case for pursuing other options. Uh, one such option uh, that the Council of Churches came up with and one which I've echoed in an opinion piece, is an idea of an amnesty. See, I think it's worth pursuing this idea of an amnesty for all kinds of reasons, but I don't want to make this a comment. I just want to put it to you. What do you think of an idea that people unite on moral grounds and say they've suffered enough, the time has come, the time has come to put an end to this suffering full stop? An amnesty or an act of humanity may be a better term for it. An act, it's time for an act of humanity. What do you think of that idea uh, running concurrently with the practical solutions that you've uh, proposed? So I like the idea, Arnold. The difficulty is how do you get enough people involved? Um, most people in Australia get their news from the News Limited Press and I don't think they're going to run the story. So that's a real problem. And you also need to get the facts out. You need to make them feel a sense of moral outrage about what's going on. But if the government won't tell them and News Limited won't tell them, what's, what, how do you get the word to them? Are you Are going to speak to every household in Australia? It's, it's very difficult. I mean, it's really interesting. News Limited newspapers in this country repeatedly refer... They use the government's language of illegals. It's absolutely false. Now, if we had a, a genuine independent press in this country, other than the Guardian Australia, which does a terrific job, but fighting in, you know, against the odds, um, if we had a diverse press, then maybe more people would know what's going on and would be outraged by it. But it's not happening.
sorry. I want to say to you, Beirut, I am sorry, and we all echo that sentiment. But this is another way of putting it down as a moment in history that not only will be saying sorry, but we were, we were we want to fight for an end to this immediately. And the idea of an act of humanity is worth pursuing for that reason, whether or not it succeeds, whether it succeeds or not. You know, and it may be a way in which facts get out, another alternative way for facts to be pursued. I mean, when I wrote that piece, it was accompanied by the fact that over 50 at that point, uh, asylum seekers or refugees or manus and um, on, on, had, had self-harmed or tried to commit suicide. So the facts got out by the very fact that I put that idea out there. And the Council of Churches also made a statement to that effect. Their statement included facts. So it was another way of trying to get it out. Mm. Well, look, I agree. Unfortunately, I think the only way to contact Fairfax these days is by sending somebody to their post office box at Channel 9. Uh, so maybe they wouldn't publish that article these days. I don't know. But there's... there's, a, there's a, oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Um, I've stopped reading the age. Um, there's another possibility. You know, I'm in the church, um, although I don't... I'm not associated with any church, but Frank might think of this idea. Um, what if on one day of the year, every minister of every religion in every church right across the country spoke some facts about what's going on and spoke about the refugee issue? Maybe that would be a way of getting the word out to lots and lots of people. Would Frank? your church go along with that? Oh, we do. We have Migrant and Refugee Sunday every year. I know, we, I know. But, we, oh, yeah. oh. but I, I think taking up the idea is to say, I mean, what's absolutely essential is to be eyeballing members of the coalition government with whatever the ideas might be. And doesn't matter whether you call it an amnesty or jubilee or let's just put this behind us, let's draw the line there have got to be the earnest attempts made with them at the same time pointing out the very hard pragmatic reasons why it's in their interests as well as ours that we put an end to all of this. Thank you very much. I'm, is that, is your question two lines long? Yes. One last two line question. And th two two line answers. <laughs> I'll just preface uh, my question by saying you said earlier that all the people in here are nodding because they agree and you need to appeal to the people under 45 so you don't need letters in the age or the Fairfax Press or News Limited, you need it on social media. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what you think of that idea. <laughs> I've been tweeting all night is yeah. what I yeah. think of that idea. <laughs> I like it. I hope it works. <laughs> Perhaps I'll get some lessons from Mr. Falau. <laughs> <laughs> so, on that very convenient two-line answers, I'm going to draw the night to an end. Um, before I give a vote of formal thanks to the various important people who have contributed to organising this night, I just want to note, so Julian said he thinks that Australians are better than this, and... I think we can understand that in a number of ways, and one of the ways in which to think about it and perhaps take this out with you as you go is that Australian history is littered with uh, examples of Australia as a country desperately trying to preserve its borders from the hordes in the north. Billy Hughes quite famously said that we had to stop the millions of yellow peril people coming into Australia. And both Nauru and New Guinea were, Australia was a mandate power for Nauru and New Guinea under the League of Nations. So that is, Australia was responsible for administering those. Essentially, it couldn't be a colonial power because Australia was a dominion. I'm an international lawyer. But, um, but Australia essentially was a colonial power over Nauru and New Guinea. So this is not new for Australia. This is a long history of Australia constructing itself. Um, as, having these very, as having a very particular idea of what borders are and what it means to preserve them. And so I think it's important to understand this not as a single sort of ma present manifestation, but as part of a long history um, in Australia. Okay, so on that note, 
I would like to thank a large number of people who have helped to put this night together. So first, a number of staff members from La Trobe, including Caroline Bruckner, Craig Costa, and in particular, Alice Turnbull, who has been responsible down here for the secret communications with Beirouz. Um, this is a really complex, this has been a really complex night to put together, uh, and one of the reasons you had to wait outside for so long was because actually we didn't have a connection with Beirouz for about 40 minutes, and then it magically kicked in at half past or at 25 past six. So uh, thank you very much to the La Trobe staff, to the staff of um, the NGV. Thank you to Arnold Zabel, who asked the question down here, who recorded an interview with Beruz a couple of weeks ago that we were going to play in the event that we really couldn't get Beruz on for tonight. Thank you to Robert Mann, whose long and deep interest in Australian life is responsible for putting these debates together. To all of you for your questions and your participation tonight. And then, of course, finally to our three speakers, Frank Brennan, Julian Burnside, and Beruz, who unfortunately can't hear us anymore, who've given us confronting, important, and amazingly hopeful things with which to leave. So please join me in thanking them. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. No, I'm sorry, I didn't disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs>